Engineers, I have an interesting one for you today. On the bench, we have a B2 Rage 1200.6. Now, it's a six channel Class D amplifier. The first four channels are run by an IRS 2093 MIC. That's directly driving four dual package MOSFETs, one per channel. So, in each of these TO220 package devices, there are two N channel MOSFETs, one high side, one low side. Then, channel five and six are a bit more beefy. We've got a pair of 2092 drive ICs, and they're directly driving some 31 N20 MOSFETs, and they're in individual FETs, one high side, one low side per channel. We've got a common SMP for all six channels, and that's just a basic TL494 generating pulses for some MOSFETs along here on the primary side of the transformer, which then gets rectified here and here for the outputs. The customer stated that this was overheating even when being run on low volume. Let's have a look at the idle current draw. When we first power it up, we have 0.8 amps, but then when Class D switching initializes, we jump to 2.8 amps, which is a little bit high for what I'd expect from this circuit. Now this is a brand new amplifier. There's no fault with it. However, but what I think we have is a design flaw, which we're going to try and correct. I pull the four MOSFETs for channel 5 and 6 away from the heatsink, and after only a minute of operation, you can see on the thermal imager, we're reaching crazy high temperatures in excess of 80 degrees Celsius. Remember, these are two separate channels, 5 and 6, so whatever's going on is happening to both of them. This amp is set up to play full range across all six channels, and if we probe the low side drain of channel 5 or 6, you see the Class D switching frequency here is very high, up at 358 kilohertz. The higher the Class D switching frequency, the higher the sample bit rate of the Class D circuit and therefore the more high frequency information you should get out of the speaker terminals. Now there could be a few reasons why these FETs are getting really hot. First issue could be a design flaw in the filter network, however I don't think that's the case. The other reason is possible cross conduction and that means there could be a bit of an overlap between when the low side turns off and the high side turns on and vice versa. That means that for a very tiny fraction of a second both MOSFETs are on at the same time, essentially giving the rails a pathway to each other like a short circuit for a nanosecond and that happening 350,000 times a second is going to cause these to get hot. Having a quick look at the data sheet for these output FETs, I wouldn't say that they're particularly hard to drive, they don't really take too long to turn on and off, and their input capacitance on the gate isn't ridiculously high either, so I would have expected these to be able to run okay at 358 kilohertz. So what else could be causing these FETs to cross conduct and get hot? Well, these drive ICs, 2092s, have programmable dead time. Dead time is the amount of time the PWM is dead between the low side turning off and the high side turning on and vice versa. Think of it a bit like biasing for class AB. The more dead time you have between low and high side, the higher the THD of the output sine wave, but the cooler the FETs will run and the less cross conduction you're going to have. In order to run really low amounts of dead time and therefore get really good THD numbers, you need to have FETs that can turn on and off really freaking quickly. And although the specs of these FETs aren't bad, they're nowhere near fast enough for the low dead time modes that these chips can provide. The programmable dead time feature of these chips is on pin 9. You can see here on the typical connection diagram that pin 9 dead time control you would connect to a voltage divider across negative rail and 12 volts VCC reference to negative rail. The values of the resistors in the voltage divider will determine what dead time mode the chip is programmed into. Further along in the data sheet it tells us what each of the dead time modes means in regards to nanoseconds and the voltage threshold reference to VCC supply each dead time mode will be in with how much voltage is actually on pin 9. Now usually in these kind of amplifiers dead time is programmed programmed to the maximum amount of dead time, therefore allowing for the coolest operation of the MOSFETs. And for that to happen, pin 9 will just be tied to negative rail, however that's not the case in this amplifier. The voltage dividers across negative rail and VCC, so to negative rail we have 3.2 kilo ohms, and to VCC we have about 3.5 kilo ohms. So that means this isn't programmed to maximum dead time. Measuring the voltage on pin 9 gives us about 5.5 volts, and VCC sitting dead on 12 volts. Now 5.5 volts is about 45% of our 12 volts VCC, so to see what dead time mode we're in 1 to 4, if the voltage on dead time pin is greater than DT1, which is typically 57% of VCC, we'll be in dead time 1, which we're not. For dead time mode 2, when the voltage on dead time is less than VDT1, but greater than VDT2, meaning less than 57%, but greater than 36%, we'll be in dead time mode 2, which at 45% of VCC puts us in dead time mode 2, giving us about 40 nanoseconds typically of dead time. That's quite a lot less than we would have if we were in dead time mode mode 4 of 105 nanoseconds. So all I need to do to get this amplifier to run more efficiently and reduce the cross conduction is put these chips in dead time mode 4. And to do that is very simple, I just need a voltage on the dead time pin that is less than 23% of VCC. Very simple to do, just tie it to negative rail. On the board, this first resistor connects DT through to VCC, so we can remove that one, and this second resistor next to it connects DT through to the low side rail. So we just need to place a little solder bridge across these resistor pads. 
So now we've done the mods of both channels five and six, let's power it up and see if these run any cooler. The first telltale factor will be the idle current. So let's see, we have 0.8 amps before class D switching and then 2.4. So we've lost 0.4 amps worth of idle current and that's just on channels five and six. That's good. The class D switching frequencies are still very high across both five and six and also one to four. So we're gonna have some cross conduction and channels one to four do draw a fair bit of idle current anyway. The 2093M chip that drives channels one to four also has the same method of setting dead time through a voltage divider here. The dead time on this chip is also probably set quite low, but I'm gonna leave that as it is because one to four are most likely to be used full range on full range drivers. So it's probably better to have a little extra cross conduction in favor of lower THD for those channels. So let's pull the thermal imager and let's see if that's any better on the heat. That's been a few minutes now and we're only at 38 degrees Celsius, a huge decrease from like 85, 90 degrees after a couple of minutes. Oh